Good morning, everyone. You are listening to Restoring Living Shorelands webinar offered by the New England chapter of the North American Lake Management Society. This is Amy Smagula, and I'm serving as your moderator for this session. Next slide. So if you are not familiar with NECNOMS or the New England chapter of NOMS, we're an affiliate of the North American Lake Management Society. As our name implies, we're comprised of members from the New England states. We have lake and watershed residents, lake association members, professionals in the field of aquatic plant management, members from academia and agency personnel. We maintain a website and run annual meetings that rotate among the states. This is our first webinar. Next slide. The webinar is set to run from 1030 to 1145. There will be three 20 minute presentations with a block of 15 minutes at the end for questions. The webinar will be recorded and shared via link later. Next slide. Our three presenters are shown here. Laura Blugalecki is our first presenter. She's with the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources and she's gonna talk about Vermont shoreland BMPs. Laura. All right, thanks, Amy. Um, as Amy said, my name is Laura DeLugalecki and I work with the regulatory group with the state of Vermont reviewing projects and providing outreach to landowners concerning the Shoreland Protection Act and lake encroachment regulations. Thank you so much for being here today and happy Earth Day. Okay, so in Vermont, we use the term natural shorelands quite a bit to describe our restoration and protection goals of the land that surrounds lakes. Ideally, these areas provide important littoral habitat or wetland and woodland habitat, and they provide a variety of ecological functions like mitigating flooding and um, preventing shoreline erosion, protecting water quality, providing shade for aquatic life and also shade that prevents algae blooms. They provide ecological corridors for wildlife and all kinds of songbirds and scenic beauty. The most important feature of a natural shoreland is its native vegetation. Notice in these photos that there are layers of vegetation. There are not only trees, but there are also shrubs and perennials, ground cover and a spongy duff layer. These layers of vegetation build the foundation of a functioning natural shoreland that can provide all those benefits I just mentioned. Over here in Vermont, we're big fans of Doug Tallamy, a professor out of the University of Delaware. This slide focuses a little bit on his research about the importance of native plants to an ecosystem. And we take this information and use it and apply it to the importance of native shoreland vegetation. So his research shows that 96% of birds depend entirely on insects to raise their young. And this insect protein can only be collected from native plants because non-native plants don't host um, this kind of, these kinds of larvae and caterpillars. The chickadee needs to go out and find between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillar larvae to feed one clutch, making about 146 trips a day. So the chickadee is very busy and needs those native plant species. Additionally, freshwater fish in lakes get 40% of their protein from insects that fall off the branches of native trees. And then of course the trees provide shade and the woody debris falls into the water providing more habitat for the fish. So all the type of vegetation on a shoreland is very important and all vegetation is not created equal. Even in this list here of native plants, there are some that provide a lot more um, insect species and food sources than others. But one of the most important messages that we like to talk about is that non-native plants provide no food. Um, crepe myrtle, English ivy, ginkgo trees, these ornamentals, although they might be pretty, they don't provide anything um, for the greater ecosystem. So we use this term natural shoreland quite a bit <clears throat> but we recognize that a natural shoreland doesn't have to be absent of all people and development. People are drawn to lakes and they want to live near lake shores. So we're looking for that balance of protection and maintenance of natural shorelands 
but also a way to support some reasonable development of the lakeshore. So today I'm gonna to talk about that balance, how we can protect the natural shoreland and still have development and the best management practices that we use for lakeshores. So a little history, um, when people buy and develop shoreland property, they convert the natural shoreland to something that's comfortable and familiar with them. They wanna bring suburbia to the lakeshore, clearing and converting some of that, those really critical features of the property, the natural vegetation. Um, in Vermont, we've seen a several decade trend of converting small modest camps on mostly forested parcels to larger year round dwellings with garages and additional amenities. And it's understandable, people have a dream, they wanna retire by the lake and they wanna bring all the comforts of home they're accustomed to. But this alters the natural lakeshore and adds additional pressures to a very ecologically sensitive area. After a lot is cleared and developed over time, many landowners may start to notice that their shoreline is eroding. And this is when they call our office to figure out what they can do to stabilize the shoreline and if they can get a permit. At one time, parcels like these had stable natural shorelines filled with vegetation, but now that they've been altered and the vegetation is removed, the soils erode and they need to be stabilized in some manner. Um, so, you know, the loss of that vegetation not only takes away some of those important bird habitat food and food sources for fish and wildlife, but also the roots and the foliage that hold the soil together and help prevent um, erosion from wind and wave and ice push. And grass lawn doesn't really hold the soil in place. It's not an adequate replacement for natural vegetation. The most common question we get is, um, can I get a seawall to support my shoreland to, to stabilize it? But in Vermont, we no longer authorize new seawalls um, because it creates this barrier between the terrestrial world and the aquatic world. And as they fail over time, it's a pretty invasive thing to remove those, excavate them out and replace them. So when parcels are developed with impervious surfaces like structures and driveways and parking areas, that additional impervious surface alters the natural hydrology of the site by preventing infiltration. Most of you have probably seen this image or one like it. The top left picture represents a naturally forested area where there's naturally about 10% runoff and most of the water is able to infiltrate or be in, in, intercepted by vegetation. As you progress through these, um, the sequence of more intensely developed property, there's fewer places for water to infiltrate and there is more runoff. So in places that have more impervious surface, they're more developed, there's less natural vegetation, um, rain or snow melt can run across the landscape and it can pick up speed moving fast and causing um, erosion and carrying nutrients and other pollutants into the water. In 2014, Vermont passed the Shoreland Protection Act, and we also, prior to the act, had a voluntary lake-wise program. These two programs together are trying to shift the culture away from large open suburban landscapes to ones that are more appropriate and protective of lake shores. That means embracing landscapes that are a little messy, less managed, not always neat and tidy, minimizing the footprint of a house or lawn area, and maintaining pathways and recreation areas in an intentional way to protect vegetation and move away from the idea of a, having a sandy beach area, which aren't natural to most areas of Vermont or New England. So in order to meet our goals, we promote lake-friendly development practices or best management practices. On sites that were developed prior to the passage of our Shoreland Protection Act regulations, we're often working to improve the parcels by better managing stormwater runoff and incorporating the natural shoreland where possible. Sometimes we're just retrofitting really poor development the best we can. But our goal is to work with the landscape, to mimic nature, to try to reestablish a natural shoreland or, and the functions of a natural shoreland using natural materials like dry laid natural stone, and vegetation and biodegradable materials. We try to minimize the use of stormwater best management practices that require the maintenance of a grass lawn or those that require bringing in lots of other materials like concrete or non-native soil or those practices that require a lot of disturbance and excavation because those don't really support our goals of restoring a natural shoreland. 
There are dozens of stormwater best management practices out there that many of you are likely familiar with. And there's kind of two categories. There's structural BMPs and more vegetative BMPs. Um, structural BMPs may use more concrete, things that are buried underground. Um, in these pictures here on the right, I've got a picture of the installation of pervious pavers. Um, on the bottom right is a dry basin, which can water is diverted into, and it can there's a big underground storage area. Moving to the middle, there's um, an infiltration trench by a parking lot that can take the runoff from the parking lot. Then there's a grass swale with check dams near a road. And then to the left are more vegetative BMPs with a rain garden and a no mow zone. Not all best management practices for stormwater are appropriate along the lake shore. In Vermont, we've developed a set of shoreland best management practices, first through the Voluntary Lakewise program for landowners, and then as requirements under our regulatory program. Uh, the BMPs that we promote, each one has a fact sheet with specifications that you can find on our website. And the goal is to install these BMPs with minimal disturbance to the lake shore that, um, that provide maximum treatment but they also provide the co-benefits that we've been talking about, like bird and pollinator habitat. <clears throat> so this also means that siting is very important. And as a regulatory program, we think a lot about maintenance, about you know, what is the likelihood that a rain garden or a green roof or some practice is gonna be stalled and gonna be maintained far into the future. All the BMPs that we promote are designed for the one inch rainstorm, which is based on the 30 year average in this area. Um, and more than one BMP might be needed at the site to address all the issues. These are a couple examples of non-vegetative or quasi-vegetative BMPs that we promote. I would say the most common stormwater BMP that we require on lakeshore properties is the installation of a drip line trench, and that's requiring through our regulatory program. This, is, this is picture is on the left. They're usually about two feet wide and about 18 inches deep filled with gravel drainage stone. These trenches slow down runoff and help infiltrate that water into the ground. They work best right around structures as planting vegetation right around a structure is not always a great idea in the long term because there might be some conflicts with roots and you know, hazards in the future. We also work with the installation of dry wells, which is similar to an infiltration trench, but it might be like a, a big gravel cavity that you can direct a, a downspout into to store greater amounts of water. And these are really good when you have a really small parcel with site constraints. Um, in the middle here is a picture of a water bar on sloped roads or driveways. Water bars are great BMPs to direct runoff into vegetated areas that can handle additional stormwater runoff. Um, you know, it's got to, you got to make sure that you're not just putting it onto your neighbor's property, but rather that the the water bars directing water into an area that can handle that additional runoff and infiltrate it and slow it down. And then on the right, I've got a picture of a rain garden. This is also called bioretention. Um, and these can be really effective depending on where they're located. So siting is really important. The rain garden can intercept runoff from like a parking area or a driveway or capture runoff from a drip line of a house if it's maybe um, directed through a downspout into the rain garden. It's really important that rain gardens are constructed appropriately to the appropriate size and dimensions. A rain garden that's too small to handle runoff from a larger parking area just won't be successful. So there's a lot of thought that has to be put into these, but they can be really beautiful and they can be a great way to manage stormwater runoff. Um, another practice we encourage is the installation of a vegetated swale. Grass line swales are really common along roadsides and shopping centers. Um, but we are looking more at bioswales that are lined with dense vegetation to treat and slow runoff. For regulatory considerations, we use the green infrastructure sizing tool. There's a link here at the bottom. There's also a lot of, we have a Vermont rain guarding manual. There's a lot of tools, but these allow us to design things to the right size and also specify, okay, we need to offset specifically 500 square feet of new impervious surface. So that means we need X linear feet of drip line infiltration trench at these dimensions. So it's a really useful tool for us to make sure that the BMPs that we're selecting are effective for the activity that's happening on the land. Um, to meet our goals of controlling stormwater runoff and restoring the natural shoreland, our number one BMP is the installation 
or the reestablishment or the protection of natural native vegetative cover. This provides slope stability, protects water quality, and all those other co-benefits that I've talked about already. Um, so in the top left, this was an eroding shoreline that was devoid of vegetation. So we've got, uh, we put down biodegradable matting, and then that's got live willow stakes in there, and those will all sprout, and the matting will is keeping it stable while other vegetation can establish. Um, in the top right, this is a regulatory project I worked on. You can see in the fall picture that house is all grass lawn. And then this is the next season where they were required to install a no-mo zone over all that grass. And they've got little flags up, which is a really important point when you're establishing a no-mo zone is having some kind of delineation like boulders or flags or a split rail fence because a lot of people outsource their lawn care and it's easy for no-mo zones to get destroyed while they're being established. So I'm, I'm excited to keep looking at that over the seasons to see how that no-mo zone will look. And these other pictures are just various stages of no-mo zones being established. Um, these are really, really good for steep slopes, establishing no-mo zones. They're effective, they're affordable, there's no maintenance. It's easy for us to quantify on the regulatory side. Um, so this is our, our number one BMP. Um, so we, in our regulations, we require people to offset any creation of cleared area with replanting, a one-for-one -one replanting. There is no structural BMP that can um, replace revegetation. However, on the voluntary side, um, we have a lot of options for encouraging more vegetation and using, um, we have this guidebook called A Guide to Healthy Lakes Using Lakeshore Landscaping. There are some great designs in there to kind of combine more wild nomo zones with some landscape areas where you can select the wild flowers you want and the native trees. So you can build up the species you desire. Um, you can put in a lot of creativity to build lake-friendly, habitat-friendly places, and to really make you realize how exciting it is to stop mowing. <clears throat> Many lake shores are on steep areas, especially right near the lake shore. Um, so if development is right near a steep slope, we work with landowners to install other practices to divert water away from the slope, like drip line trenches and infiltration practices right around that structure. Anything to lessen the velocity of water going over the slope. Um, but for existing development that's already on a steep slope, we promote best management practices like water bars to direct water flow into vegetated swales. This picture is from a driveway that was a regulatory project I worked on, and they were supposed to install water bars, but they didn't. So you can see there's kind of some gully formation. And so the next season they fixed it. This is a little hard to see, but they tilted the driveway to land into a gravel dry well. And then there's some larger rocks there to slow down the water. And then beyond that slope, there's some infiltration steps to kind of capture and slow more water as it moves down. Um, Best management practices for steep slopes are focused around minimal disturbance to the slope. And in some cases, the best management practice is to restore an eroded slope. Um, so we're trying to minimize all impacts to that steep slope because it's just so fragile. So instead of having a large pathway straight down to the water, using staircases or meandering paths and keeping as much natural shoreline there as possible to prevent slope erosion. And Amy Peacock's gonna be talking about this more later, but um, on steeper slopes, we use bioengineering practices to restore a more gradual slope um, using natural materials and vegetation to provide long-term stability. Um, so with our Shoreland Protection Act regulations, we require landowners to offset new impervious surface areas that exceed our standards. The best, best management practice to address too much impervious surface is just to remove some of that impervious surface. Sometimes we work with people to find an old shed or patio that they're no longer being used. Um, or if they're rebuilding a house, we try to get them to have a smaller footprint or build up rather than out. But then another BMP we talk about frequently is the replacement of impervious surfaces with pervious. So these are some examples of um, parking areas that were converted to pervious pavers. 
Um, and then also we do have a way to quantify the capture of the drip line infiltration trench to offset new impervious surface. And of course, planting additional vegetation can help dampen the impacts from stormwater runoff. Um, but these are kind of the most common ones we use to offset impervious surface to meet our thresholds for permitting. I just have a couple examples to run through um, of projects here in Vermont. Uh, here's an example of a, an eroding path down to the water. It was regraded to tilt and let the water drain off the path. Because it's steep, water by bars were installed to slow the water and capture it and transport it into naturally vegetated areas to prevent further erosion on the sloped path. Here's an example on the left of a bio infiltration area near a driveway and parking area. It directs that water into that vegetated area to prevent water from running down toward the lake, or at least slowing it down. And then on the right, here's a steep slope that was eroding and there was no clear path, so everyone was walking everywhere, increasing the impacts. So the slope was made more gradual. Uh, the pathway was better defined. Those are infiltration step, steps that help slow down water and allow it to infiltrate. And then vegetation will establish on the side to help protect that slope long term. So shoreland best management practices used in Vermont um, in both the voluntary manner and through our regulatory program are designed to meet our vegetation protection standards that we've developed for the state, but they're also designed to protect and restore living shorelands that provide a bounty of additional ecological benefits. We're looking at a culture shift away from lawns and toward bringing nature back to your property. People who live near lakes love their lakes and maintaining vegetative BMPs is the best way to show your lakes some love. And that's all I've got, thank you. I know I went through everything really fast, but 20 minutes goes by fast when you have a lot to say. So I'm going to, um, share my screen with Holly. As we transition over to Holly Greenleaf's presentation, uh, we are holding questions until the end. So if you do have a question, please use the chat box to enter it, and then we'll go through the questions at the end of the webinar. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Laura. That was awesome. Um, my name is Holly Greenleaf. I'm an ecological landscape designer, and I'm so grateful to be here today presenting on ecological design for water quality, wildlife, and well-being um, in honor of Earth Day today with NECNOMS. So, oops, one second. Okay, so um, here are some examples of the lakescaping posters that I designed with the LakeWise program um, showing uh, best management practices and native plants for uh, restoring your shore. And so these are some examples of a more vegetated uh, lakeshore. And I'm going to share today some ecological design principles that will help you get here um, if you're starting from a cleared land uh, or lakeshore, one that has mostly lawn and needs to be built back up with vegetation. So here are some ecologic, ecological design principles for living uh, shores. And um, one is design with nature or design for succession. And so really what we're trying to do is to create the conditions for nature to flourish so providing as many tools as we can for um, the natural succession of a landscape to take place. And then, um, and I'll go into more detail in, with these in the next couple of slides. Um, the next one is to employ natural patterns and processes. So utilizing um, natural hydrology and typography uh, patterns and the processes of water flow that is found in the landscape um, in order to protect water quality and increase flood resiliency um, and protect the lakeshore ecosystem. And so those top two are really about mimicking uh, natural habitats to create uh, the structures so that the functions of 
mutually beneficial communities can arise. Um, and then going back to Laura had mentioned this, but minimizing dis disturbance where possible and maximizing benefits of these vegetative best management solutions. Um, so leaving as much vegetation as you can is really key to maintain the uh, mature root systems. And then finally, um, I'll talk about designing for human enjoyment. It's a really important piece because humans are the ones that are, are play a key role in protecting these valuable places. And it's also so important to enjoy the lake shores and um, create spaces to access that um, and enjoy all the benefits of being able to live and uh, spend time on lakes. So designing with nature and designing for succession. So a key piece of this is um, while when revegetating lake shores is employing multi-layered planting. And so you can see in the photo at the bottom, this is a natural shoreland and there is so many layers of vegetation. It's basically a solid green wall there. And so thinking about planting all the way from root diversity, um, creating uh, environments for fungi, mycelium to flourish, as well as maintaining a duff layer. So this is all about leaving organic matter on the ground. So leaves and dead plant material, that creates the organic matter that builds the soil and actually increases the water holding capacity of your lake shore. Um, and so letting that um, decomposition process occur. And then um, thinking about ground covers, low growing um, herbaceous and woody species, and then the herba herba herbaceous understory. So those are your um, flowering perennials and your grasses, and then shrubs and understory plants, um, woody shrubs. Moving up, it's really important as well to plan for replacement trees. So when large trees die from wind or age, you ha already have those established trees coming up below them to replace them and keep that life cycle that of really um, strong root systems going. Because once you lose that strong root system, it's really hard to gain it back um, and keeps all the soil in place as plants mature. Um, and then finally, your canopy, your large trees. And so, um, oops, one second. So, with the going back to the root diversity, root diversity is a really key part of bank stabilization for lake shores. Um, as you can see in this image here from the Conservation Research Institute, showing the different root systems of various plant species. And so, you can see all the way on the left side. Um, that's like your typical lawn showing Kentucky bluegrass. And you can see that the roots basically mirror what's happening above ground. And so all these native plants um, have much more extensive root systems. And by planting species that have a variety of root systems, so that could be plants with deep tap roots that mine deep into the soil or more laterally growing extensive roots, um, that can help to secure the soil for maximum resiliency against high water levels and flooding. And it also increases um, water holding capacity by um, increasing the soil tilth, adding organic matter when the plants die back, and then reversing compaction actually by creating these healthy microbiomes. So biodiversity is a huge piece of ecological design um, for lakeshore restoration. So like I said before, the more types of plants you can plant that have di uh, diversity of roots, types of leaves, different flowers, you're creating more surface area and more niches for species to thrive. And so creating more space for insects that will feed the birds and feel, feed feed the freshwater fish and all the aquatic um, species along the shoreline. And not to mention that lake shores provide a really important wildlife corridor um, for larger animals as well. 
And so there's so much that is unknown about the mutually beneficial relationships between plants. Um, currently there is research happening in the stormwater lab at UVM where I went um, for my master's program on what mycelium or the roots of fungi can do, those relationships between plant roots and um, mycelium or mycorrhizae, um, mycorrhizae, sorry, um, to benefit water quality. And there's just so much that happens that if we can just create the structure of a biodiverse lakeshore ecosystem, that the functions will naturally arise and nature will reorganize itself to maximize those co-benefits that we've been talking about. So looking to natural patterns and processes to direct our designs, um, things like looking at hydrology and how to manage upland water, water runoff. This is a picture of a rain garden here. And so using earthworks and um, to capture upland water runoff before it reaches the lakeshore is really important to protect the lakeshore ecosystem. And then also um, for bank stabilization, any types of things that we can really intentionally design access and um, re-sloping of banks so that we can mimic that natural uh, shoreland pre-development and um, be able to manage water runoff effectively. So here's a project we did, I think this is Lake Seymour, um, where you can see on the left-hand side before there was a really steep bank as a result of the uh, shoreland being leveled off at some point. And so over on the right side, we, you can see we re-sloped the bank back a little bit for a more gradual slope um, to reduce erosion and runoff and then installed a rock toe at the base. So that holds the soil in place and also helps to manage some fluctuating water levels and um, ice push in the winters. And then establishing a diversity of native shrubs and trees and herbaceous species. Um, again, using that biodegradable landscape fabric to prevent erosion until the roots get established. And you can see this is one year later, um, plants getting a little bit more established. I'd love to see that, what it looks like now. Um, so here's another project, uh, managing upland runoff again. So a lot of erosion you can see on the left side from the driveway. And so we built a, dug a swale that diverted the driveway runoff into a vegetative vegetated area on the right to that could handle the water and help infiltrate it into the ground and then also creating more intentional uh, walkway a meandering infiltration steps to also help to infiltrate water um, and reduce overland uh, runoff of water and then establishing vegetation on either side. So anything that we can do to slow down water runoff, spread it and sink it into the ground that can help uh, reduce erosion of sediments and also the organic matter that is um, key for building the, um, the fertility of the land and the, the health of the ecosystems and the plants there. So, and then coming back to Laura talked a bit about um, these BMPs, but rain gardens and bioretention, swales, um, infiltration trenches, all these things that help to manage upland water runoff by capturing it, um, allowing it to settle and absorbing it into the ground, um, thereby recharging the groundwater before it flows directly into nearby waterways and filtering out all the excess nutrients and sediments and other pollutants. So all of these um, practices to reduce erosion, improve water quality, flood resiliency, and protect those lakeshore ecosystems. Um, here's another, uh, this is a section showing that relationship of managing upland water runoff. So with a rain garden here, capturing runoff from a parking lot before it flows directly into the river. So letting all those sediments and pollutants settle. Um, and then minimizing disturbance and maximizing the benefits of your lakeshore ecosystem. So leaving vegetation wherever possible 
and then planting, prioritizing vegetative solutions. Um, and this also includes like woody debris and shallow water. So minimize disturbance, leaving, um, leaving what you can to create important habitats for aquatic and uh, terrestrial species along the lakeshore. Um, this also goes back to no mo zones. So creating kind of natural wildflower meadow areas by just letting it go and maybe mowing once a year or once every couple of years. And then finally, designing for human enjoyment. So this is a key piece um, to, in my work, uh, working with the LakeWise program, um, people have to want to, to install these lakeshore restoration practices and um, have it benefit their overall property and experience of their place. And so a big thing is people want to maintain views understandably. And so working with that and framing views with trees and other uh, veg uh, plant species um, can help actually improve your view and create more um, vegetation along the shoreline. And then, like Laura had talked about as well, designing for intentional access and enjoyment. And so the Shoreland Protection Act allows, like, I think up to eight feet of water access. And so creating um, really intentional, whether it's a meandering pathway or infiltration steps, basically allowing humans to come in contact with the water and really enjoy that benefit, but also not funneling water runoff directly into the lake while we do that. And you can see here, this is a design for a beach. The boulders not only provide seeding, but also help protect the plants from ice push in the winter. And then oftentimes um, property owners don't want to plant um, trees and taller species in front on their lakeshore, especially if it's a small access area. And so while we really encourage um, planting multi-layered uh, vegetative buffers with trees and shrubs and all of that, sometimes it's just, it's something is better than nothing. And so everyone loves flowers and in the least reestablishing herbaceous perennials and um, shrubs wherever possible is really important piece by converting lawn into native plantings. So here are a couple of photo simulations because um, visuals are really important to help people visualize um, what these practices may look like on their own properties. Um, so designs and graphics and photo simulations can really help to push the um, help to convince and show that these ecological designs can be really beautiful as well as beneficial. So here's a lakeshore with pretty limited um, a vegetative buffer and some erosion happening, and then showing what it would look like to increase the vegetative buffer with more um, layers of trees and shrubs and also establishing a, a wild nomo wildflower meadow while also leaving space to enjoy the lake shore. Here's a failing retaining wall. Um, and these were these projects I did with Annie White um, of Nectar Landscape Design in collaboration with LeakWise. So a failing retaining wall with a mown lawn and very little vegetation, and then showing a re-sloping of the bank, taking out the retaining wall and putting in a large boulder rock toe and planting native plants. So just helping to visualize what that could look like. Uh, this is the guide to healthy lakes using lakeshore lands landscaping that Laura mentioned. Um, I helped to do the designs for this in collaboration with, uh, this is Federation of Vermont Lakes and Ponds and um, Gavin Zeitz and Stephanie Hurley, Judy Davis all collaborated on this with, um, as well as the LakeWise program. And so just move through this quickly showing uh, planting templates for different types of slopes, um, sample planting plans for different conditions, whether that be clay soil or shady areas. Um, and then uh, native plant lists as well. And you can find that online, the Federation of Vermont Lakes and Ponds. 
And then really quickly, just moving through an example project of establishing a rain garden in Newport along the Clyde River, diverting the parking lot runoff into this uh, uh, bowl-shaped garden here with native plants. And can see the before up top and the after down below. And before up here, you can see all this sediment and pollutants running straight from the parking lot right into the lake. And then uh, below, we diverted that runoff into a little rain garden and planted the whole bank with trees and woody shrubs. And then this is one year later, and hopefully it's even bigger now, a few years out. So establishing these. Um, really diverse uh, lake shores right along these important um, places between parking lots and rivers. And here's a couple more of the lakescaping posters. So showing a couple native trees for that canopy layer, some woody shrubs, and then some herbaceous perennials. And all these posters are actually for sale to support the LakeWise program. So that is all sharing these uh, ecological design principles to mimic nature and allow, um, basically providing the tools and the structure of the ecosystem to allow the functions to arise and thrive and let nature take her course. Thank you so much. And so I'll hand, this and questions can be um, added. I'll hand the off to Amy. Fico. One moment. Yeah, questions can be um, asked in the chat box, and we'll have time at the end to answer those. Holly, did can you see my screen? Yes. Is it full size? Um, it's still your desktop screen. Okay. Yep. Good. Thank you. Perfect. Hello, everyone. Thank you for participating in today's New England chapter of the North American Lake Management Society's webinar on shorelands. And thanks to Holly Greenleaf and Laura Dugalecki for their prior shoreland presentations. I'll be sharing with you some of the first bioengineering projects installed in Vermont. Vermont has about 800 lakes and ponds in addition to our largest lake, Lake Champlain. Up until about five years ago, prior to learning and practicing bioengineering methods, we mostly permitted and installed seawalls to stabilize eroding banks which is what Laura mentioned earlier. Today, we better understand that vertical walls physically block access to and from the water for turtles, frogs, and other animals that need, to con that, that need contact with the land to feed, rest, and, and nest. A seawall is a hard scape of the shoreland installed to block the waves from reaching the land. They're made out of many materials, including concrete, steel, and rock-filled wood structures. But they don't allow for the absorption of energy that waves bring in. So when waves hit the seawall, their energy is either bounced back out to the water, often scouring the base of the wall, which is shown here in this graphic, or the wave energy is deflected over to the neighbor shore, increasing erosive conditions there. Bioengineering methods are considered softscape engineering techniques used to stabilize slopes in shorelands with native plants, biodegradable products, and other natural materials. These methods protect property from waves and erosion while filtering stormwater to the lake and protecting or restoring wildlife habitat. In Vermont, we first learned about these methods from the Michigan Natural Shoreline Partnership and the work they were doing with Brian Micah from GEI Consultants. 
Since then, Emily Hauser from the New York DEC has hosted the Sustainable Shorelines Design Webinar Series featuring bioengineering projects designed to build resiliency along coastal areas to living shoreland restoration projects installed along fresh waterways. We've also learned a lot here in Vermont uh, from geosyntech consultants and many others working on restoring li living shorelands. But we still feel like we have a lot more to learn. And uh, I wanted to put this slide in to particularly thank those who have taken the lead of ahead of us. So in the next few slides, I'm gonna showcase several bio bioengineering methods we've installed to stabilize eroding shores, ranging from the simplest method of using live stakes to fiber core rolls, moving into encapsulated soil lifts, and then finishing with installing um, a live crib wall. So in 2011 in Vermont, uh, we had a high water, lots of flooding on Lake Champlain, and it led to bank failure, especially where the natural vegetation had been cleared and lawn had been planted. So the Northwest Regional Planning Commission in 2012 received a state grant to work with contractors and engineers to stabilize shores, repurposing materials and using native vegetation. This live staking project was one of the first successful bioengineering projects installed in Vermont. And uh, I don't have a more recent photo from 2017, but it's really coming beautifully. But the live stakes are vegetative cuttings. They're about one to three feet in length and they're a half to one inch in diameter that are fast rooting in mo moist soils like willows and dogwoods. They also work well on rocky steep soils and are harvested and planted during dormancy, so late fall or early spring. This is a project last year, about this time, late April, early May, um, at the Waterbury State Park. And it's another example of a low budget bioengineering option using the live stakes. And it just shows how fast that they can come in. Within just a couple months, um, these willows and dogwoods had, had sprouted. But I also wanted to show this particular project because we didn't have easy access to this site. It was out off of a trail and not easy to bring other materials to. So the live stakes worked really well in this um, somewhat of a remote site. So in 2015, the Lake Iroquois Fish and Wildlife Access Area, which is uh, outside of Burlington, Vermont in, in Williston area, um, was eroding. And as you can see by where the shore is, is sloughing off, there was um, extensive threat to water quality from this problem. So in collaboration with the engineers within the Agency of Natural Resources, we came up with a fiber core roll design. So a fiber core roll is usually about 10 feet in length and they're made of coconut fibers. They come in different diameters, uh, 12 or 16 inches. And in this particular design, you can see on the screen there, we intended to use the fiber core roll to reestablish a toe right at the water's edge and then slope back to a two to one or three to one slope and plant with native vegetation. Well, it's one thing to design these bioengineering projects and another to install them. Since there were no experts in Vermont with bioengineering methods prior to 2015, we brought in Brian Micah from GEI Consultants to train us in, in the installation. The project was successful and now serves as a demonstration project to help inspire others to use bioengineering to restore living shorelands whenever and wherever possible. And um, it's 
it's really come in beautifully. And I love going back to revisit this every year since it really was one of our first projects with fiber core rolls. So in 2017, uh, we decided we would continue with these, these softscape bioengineering methods. And this was uh, a very challenging site. We had about 300 feet of shoreline with a vertical drop ranging from, I think it was five to eight feet. And as you can see, we can't slope back and use the fiber core roll slope back and plant. So in this case, we had to slope out and the method was to use encapsulated soil lifts, which are almost like mini terraces. And again, we wanted to achieve that two to one or three to one slope so that ice, wind and waves could ride up the shore and no longer bash into it, which is happening here in, with the vertical drop. Uh, and so we went ahead and worked on this design with uh, the local road crew and not having installed anything like this in Vermont before, we brought Brian Micah back <laughs> For another training day and we uh, worked with the different youth conservation groups the Northwood Stewardship Center and the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps as well as thank you to my colleagues with an agency of natural resources and many private contractors that came out to learn how to um, how to protect the integrity of the role, road well protecting water quality and restoring this uh, living shoreline. So this is just within two years and it's taken really well. We will continue to monitor this site. It does have a, um, it's a high energy site. So uh, it will be important to continue to count the number of plants that have survived and keep tabs on this particular project. As well as monitor it for other threats, um, when all, all of these bioengineering projects involve native plants and there can always be plant mortality, you expect somewhere between 10 to 30% of plant mortality, but there's also threats from beavers and and even neighbors coming in and pruning with their clippers. And in this case, somebody actually came in and built a deck over the project. And we definitely didn't expect that. So fencing is very important to keep out dogs, people, and to keep animals back, to protect these restoration sites when they're most vulnerable in the first three years. So in the southern part of Vermont, this is way down um, at Lake Rapunda, we tried again to use the encapsulated soil lifts and with success and just want to say that going back to what Holly and Laura emphasized earlier, we plant with native plants and we do an assortment of shrubs and herbaceous plants to reestablish uh, the tiers that would be natural along an undisturbed shoreline. Again, we have offered training days when we install these practices so that we can teach others how to use these methods and so that more people will have the skills to use them in their future work. I'm going to show you. A final project here, which is a bioengineering project that's called the Live Crib Wall. And this was installed up at Waterbury State Park on the reservoir. And this one involves the biodegradable products, the native plants, but a little more structural support from hemlock timbers as well. The idea is that the timbers, when they decay, the plant roots by then will have taken hold and will have stabilized the shore. 
this was an interesting project because we also provided access during the middle of the crib wall, these stairs going down. Um, it was a backcountry site, so a little more complicated in trying to get those timbers and the native plants across by boat. But so far it's held up really well. This is one year later. Um, these tend to dry out more than the other bioengineering methods. So like all of the practices working with live native plants, watering is very important. And this particular design needed to have more frequency of a watering plan. So I'll just wrap up here with some results from the bioengineering demonstration projects and trainings that we've had. We have uh, with with what we've done in the last five years, more or less, we've um, worked with the permit specialist, Laura Dugalecki's team in Shoreland Permitting, and these softscape methods have become the preference for stabilizing shorelands. We've also worked with over 500 contractors, introducing them to bioengineering through the Natural Shoreland Erosion Control Certification Program. That's an in-class training, but we've off, in addition to that, we offer these field on-site trainings for the installation. And we've had about 50 contractors go through um, and attend these field trainings. And we also feel really um, supported by the Federation of Vermont Lakes and Ponds with their interest and their promotion of these softscape methods to restore living shorelands. And I feel like the trend of hardscape the shore has been halted and even reversed. And we're headed more towards using these nature-based solutions because we've seen hundreds of shoreland owners, towns, state parks, businesses, and private homeowners recognize the value of these natural shorelands and have bought into using them and choosing them as Holly mentioned earlier with her um, ecological design overview. So here's an example I'll finish with. This is an ice push damage back in 2016 over at Maidstone Lake, the before picture and then the after restoring this one Shoreland Properties owner frontage with a private contractor, Nectar Landscape Design in the Essex County Natural Resource Conservation District. Having worked with the trainings in the contractor Natural Shoreland Erosion Control Certification Program, there are more designers, engineers, consultants aware of these methods and practicing them and working with shoreland owners to restore living shorelands. So it's very exciting to see this spread and these practices more commonly used. So that's it for me with using the bioengineering methods to restore living shorelands. I want to thank you for participating in today's webinar. This slide, I'll come back to it in a second. Uh, this is our presenter information for today. And again, I wanna thank the board for the New England chapter of the North American Lake Management Society for working to host this webinar. Big thank you to Amy Smagula from the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Sciences for moderating this webinar and making it possible. And Amy's going to come back now to take any questions and wishing you all a very happy and healthy Earth Day. Thank you, Amy Peacock. Uh, and also thank you to Laura Dugalecki and Holly Greenleaf for their presentations. I have not seen any questions pop up in the chat box. So we will take a moment to allow you guys to type in any questions if they came up during the webinar. Um, 
If you would like to learn more about NEC NOMS, you can visit us at the link on the bottom of this screen. And to learn more about our parent organization, the North American Lake Management Society, you can visit us at that link as well. Uh, the webinar, as I mentioned at the beginning, was recorded, and we will have a copy of the webinar on both of the websites that are listed here so that you can access them and share them as um, appropriate with folks that may be interested. Um, if Amy could switch back to the previous slide. Amy Peacott, if you could bump back one slide. It, uh, sorry about that it goes, but our information will be available through this link. The presenter information will be available if you want to have Amy test just um, revisit this webinar through these websites. Yeah, I just wanted to show email addresses for each of the presenters in case you want to contact them later. There we go. So this is the contact information for each of the presenters in today's webinar. And if you'd like to reach out to them, I'm sure they'd all be happy to follow up with any additional information. I am not seeing any questions come in at this point through the um, chat box on the webinar screen. So at this time, I'm going to close the webinar and thank everybody for attending. And again, thank each of our three presenters for sharing such excellent information in such a timely fashion, um, considering the fact that it is the start of the growing season. And I hope this inspired some of you to go out and do some planting on your shoreline or partner with others to do some planting uh, this spring and this summer. So thank you again for attending and everybody be well. Thank you. Thank you.